Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed. This is a special one. We've got the four of us, all four hosts, myself, Ron Hayes, Jason Loftus, Mark Raycroft, and coming to us from Colorado, Michael Morrow. Guys, how are we doing? Going good, going good. Just creeping up here on, on it's almost Christmas, right? Only a couple more days. Uh-oh. Oh, it I was Christmas up. like two months ago. Oh, sorry. No, this is Aaron. When is this Aaron? February. Next week. No, so it's last, Aaron next week. It's the last episode of season Don't mess three. With me. So we can talk about Christmas, right? Sorry, Everybody Mike. Everybody loves Christmas. Okay, Jason, go ahead and start over with Christmas. <laughs> no, we're keeping that in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's almost Christmas. So, yeah, just kind of getting ready for that. Uh, not doing as much this year with all the closures and everything, right? But trying to be responsible with gatherings and all that good stuff. But uh, looking forward to spending some time with the family and, and, yeah, just getting some editing done. What are you editing? I'm still working on deer rut photos and I got a couple of sheep photos I need to get edited up. And yeah, I'm getting close, but that's going to be nice to be caught up this year way earlier than I usually am. That's for sure. That's got to be your story too, Mark. Editing season for the next three months. Hopefully I'll be finished in three months. Did you shoot that much this year though? Yes. I shot a lot. I did. I did take a lot of pictures and... A lot of editing, a lot of marketing to do, but it's a good season to do it, especially this quiet year. And and marketing's more important than ever because it's just tough out there. So, so what's a marketing? What when you say marketing, what does that mean? That's top secret. That's a code word for trying to sell your pictures. <laughs> does that mean? Are you marketing to new people, or are you just? letting current clients know that hey i got all this new material and it needs to be uh well i just want to see if you're interested. Seen. yeah yeah no i'm marketing to this new exciting project called wild and exposed podcast nice yeah images for their social media no it's both of what you said it's it's i've always had success marketing with existing clients kind of on a monthly basis here's the new stuff and touching base so there's that there's a matter of uh, creating the new imagery and putting it together in, a, in an appealing way for existing clients but it's also in this very changing times where you know some companies i've worked with for 20 years are are disappearing this year they're changing it's going and so it's finding new ones as well and taking advantage of this global marketplace and these multimedia platforms and thinking about stuff like that. So, but it is editing season and uh, I did get a new calendar in the mail today though. Uh, a new actual calendar. printed calendar? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I mean, is it something you can calendars. actually hold or is it yeah. just digital ones and zeros? It was a real calendar. And when I opened it about an hour and a half before the podcast and flipped through it, under my happy light, full spectrum lighting, have to do that in these short days. I sit in the chair under my happy light. There were three Jason Loftus pictures in it. Sweet. It was fantastic. Oh. Yes. Now I know what now I know what calendar you got. <laughs> That's awesome. Was it RMEF? Yes, it was all elk. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation calendar arrived today. So fantastic, Jason. Thank you, sir. Great Thank shots. You. Yeah, it was fun. I feel honored to be have some images in there. That was pretty cool. You have more images than anybody else in there, my friend. Uh. Just have images. <laughs> hey, it's not a contest. <laughs> no, but it's good. It's 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 it it talks to your portfolio, the diversity That's... of it, the quality of it. When you start seeing results like that, it's a great a great uh, accolades to your efforts. Yeah, thank you. How about you, Mike? Uh, I haven't been doing much editing, but I've been doing a lot of web stuff for that. Those guys over at Wild and Exposed, <laughs> they don't pay very well, but I've been doing a lot of work for them. I'm sure they appreciate it because yeah. you're really talented, I hear. <laughs> no, it's been fun. Just working on the website. Curve. Oh, yeah, and lots of learning curve stuff. We need to have a full-time like 
web expert on staff. So if anybody wants to do lots of web stuff for low pay. SEO. 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 Yeah. Search engine optimization, right? Yeah. Something I like mean, that. It's uh, everything. And Satellite. You, if you're working with Google or if you're working with Facebook, or you're working with Instagram, or you're working with any, they're all different. They're all, I mean, there's some same, but there's some different and you kind of got to know each platform and it's not rocket science. It's just doing it. A lot of time learning it and then implementing it. Right. Right. Even, yeah. Even Instagram's time. What about you, Ron? What are you doing? I'm taking an Insta break. That's a good one. I finally hit I finally hit five thousand. So I found a milestone and so I'm just gonna breathe for a bit. Good. Trying to chill out. I, I was able to get out and film some sheep uh the last let's see, two out of the last three weekends. And so I am working with some video. I got some kind of neat uh neat footage of you at a, a ram jumped up this cliff. The U tried to jump up behind him, and then she fell off backwards. Got that all in 4K 120, so it was kind of neat. And I can – it's kind of interesting. I'm going to put the sequence together as it happened, but then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up because it almost looks like he pursued her because when she fell off the cliff, then he came back down, sniffed her up again, and then kind of got her turned around, and, and back up they went. And so you could do it multiple ways. You could do it where it looks like she he chased her off and they both ended up back down in the river bottom and then they jumped back up. Or you could do it the way that it actually happened or you could do it with a little splice here and there, a little mix of everything. So it's, uh, you know, you can see where you can have some fun with some of this footage and that's part of the artistic process, I guess, with the, with the video. But it was uh, it was a unique sequence, I think. Uh, ran into Doug Gardner. He was doing a video workshop up there, and uh, had a good group of people. The the Glatzes, Glatz Nature video, I think, um, on YouTube, they were up there and and uh, had their wild and exposed gear on. So it was fun to meet them in the field. That was pretty neat. And then. Uh, you know, of course, just seeing seeing some other folks out there, but enjoying some enjoying some quiet. That was the that was the best thing. So, are you going to do a new app called Instabreak? Yeah, I think I think it's a good idea. And what is it? Does uh, it just I'm come up to a it. white screen? Yeah, I'm going to sell it for two ninety nine. It's going to be reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to basically shut your phone down. Is what that's going to do. Just deny access I, to the app for like a week or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? You know what made me do it is I got the update. The Apple phone every week updates you on how much time you're spending on the phone. And I got the update and I was like, that is half my day right there. And so that has created the necessity for an Insta break and a Facebook break and all that kind of stuff. But it's good to do. It's good to do. It's healthy. Yeah, once in a while, I think so. Does that yours come in at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings? That's when mine comes in. I it's like, know. I want to enjoy the rest of my weekend. But when that stat comes up every time, it's like, oh. And you know, and I just was talking to a friend the other night. I really hope that those minutes and hours that it says you used on average over the last week includes like phone calls and everything. It better. I, Otherwise. <laughs> I hope the same thing, Mark. Otherwise, I've. <laughs> Got about a half a year's worth of time. I'm never going to get back just in the last year. So, well, I you can I look at just it. Instagram if you want. Yeah, I was going to say you can look at the analytics and it'll show your total screen time. Then it'll break it down for you by which apps and so on. Okay, if you get well, into I'll do it. that, yeah, yeah, it'll make you well, feel better. Do that and then issues. go watch Social <laughs> yeah. Dilemma. <laughs> yeah. You might you might want to know the answer to that question, and then you might not. Yeah. <laughs> well, the hard thing is, is this is a. Uh, it's not like we're just doing this for fun. I mean, it's not like we're just have a day job and then we just put up pictures of the whatever volleyball game that we played in over the weekend. We're putting up stuff that helps market what we do. So it's, you got to kind of do it, but you also get wrapped up in some of the other stuff too, because you do see your buddies or whoever, you know, having a barbecue or you, and you want to interact and it just, 
it's a compounding kind of thing. Yeah, and Ron said it right. It does steal your time. It really does. So go watch The Social Dilemma. Mike's right. <laughs> yeah, but then that's more screen time. <laughs> yeah, but that's screen time well spent. <laughs> yeah. To open yeah. your eyes to the reality of how this thing works. But yeah. So is it worth setting a timer on it or something? I don't know. Just thinking. People, it, I know you can, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, I, I do genuinely enjoy Instagram and, and the relationships of the people for the most part there that interacts. It's, it's positive and I like seeing the work, but as a business slant to it, it's, it is a lot of time. So just, yeah, I, th I think maybe that's something being the, the last podcast of this year, I don't, I'm not one for new year's resolutions. I really am not, but yeah. maybe, maybe setting that to like an hour a day and just having it cut and say, okay, I did what I could in an hour. That's it. Did that yeah. timer would go off at <laughs> no, not seven 30 every morning. Not for Raycroft. I, I do not my post Raycroft. in the morning. Oh, for you it would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then I'm done. Well, oh, I, yeah. I guess it's free not up a bad your day. It's not but, a bad it, day. but yeah, you have to shake it up. So you I did it. I did Instagram faithfully for like 30 days. And I, you, know, you can see that you gain followers and you gain some traction. But then I just can't keep it up. So then I do the whole what kind of what Ron's doing. I'll do maybe three images a week. And that seems to work out pretty good. But I don't gain as much traction as like you do, Mark. Or Jason, you do. Jason. You guys do a lot, you know, as far as interacting with the audience and interacting with just different posts. And I think it's good. I think it's it's time well spent from a business point of view. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we need it, right? I mean, all those, um, you know, from a business point of view, what do they call the your reach, you know? the um, What's the word I'm looking for, Ron? Or any one of you guys? When you go into your analytics? Yeah, I think There's reach so is right. Stats. Reach yeah. is right. Anyways, yeah, that's one of them. Your, your, your total reach, right? That's right. a kind of an important um, stat for that kind of stuff. And with what we're trying to do, you know, that's important to try to keep that up. And the only way to keep that up where it needs to be is to continue to post. Like, you got to pay the, play the games with the algorithms. We've talked about it a million times. But that's what's hard is it just it continues to drive you to try to be more and more engaged to where you're posting two or three times a day potentially or whatever the magic number is. But that's hard to do. I mean, you know, you're going to spend five, six hours a day trying to run an Instagram page. And and I have noticed, to your point, Mike, when you step away from it, especially for like a week solid, it, it's amazing how much all that falls off. It it Like it is punishing you <laughs> for taking that break for sure. But I've done it like five times this last year where I didn't post anything and took a complete week off and it was well worth it. My my mental sanity was was uh, rewarded for it for sure. And I think it's healthier to do that, but it's a balance because you're always trying to, you know, play the numbers game and keep the metrics where they need to be and so on and so forth. But yeah. Speaking of balance, we even talk about it too much, but <laughs> it's, it, it, it is a, it's a thing in my life. I need, I need a break from it once in a while. And whether that's, you know, once a quarter, once every couple months, once a month, just need to take some time away. And especially, you know, over the holiday season, um, you've got things that you want to do with family and, and take that time to spend with family and friends. So it was a good time to do that. So today's episode, we're going to go ahead. Uh, not long ago, Mark posted a question or posed a question on the Wild and Exposed story. And we got some feedback, got some good questions back. We got some that, you know, we're going to have to send you to Nunya Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> if you've been with the podcast long enough, you know what that means. <laughs> um, there, there are some questions that we won't answer, but most of these questions are, are very good, insightful and they, they kind of are going to help us dig a little bit into areas that maybe we wouldn't have talked about otherwise. So, Mark, fire away. Right, and that's on Instagram. So we posted that story <laughs> and that request. I did say 
that we might feature them. So obviously we're not going to feature them all because we don't know what's going to come in. But literally there were, were quite a few great questions from a variety of people that we interact with, many of them regularly on Instagram. So we can, let's start with this one from BK Wildlife Photo, BK underscore wildlife underscore photo. What is the one animal you've never been able to photograph that you would like to? Ron Hayes. No, have... it's not, I'm not saying that I want to photograph you. <laughs> I'm saying you can answer. I was throwing that you'd answer first. <laughs> I was just going to say you've had your chance. <laughs> True. Um, True. You know, I'm the I'm the guy that grew up with those uh, Time Life books, the whole animal series, and and that's the only entertainment that we had. I lived on a ranch. We didn't have TV. We had one radio station, but we had these Time Life books. And so I'm the kid that's dug in to those books, and and some of them, especially I'll share one, Dangerous Sea Creatures. That one wore completely out. The the cover is off that book. I read it so much, or or at least looked at the pictures. So I have so many animals that I would like to interact with, just be able to see. Um, you know, the first ones that I can think of, probably the first two, polar bears and spirit bears, but those have been done a lot. I would like to honestly go to the highlands of Ethiopia, and there is a species of, I can't tell you the species right now, of a monkey they've got this big red v on their chest they look like a cross between a baboon and a lion but where they live has got these unbelievable backdrops because you're you know you're at about 10,000 feet and so the the mountains falling off down into the plains is is fairly steep and these backdrops with with these animals are un, unreal so that's one place that I would like to go. That's one of it's one of a thousand. <laughs> I don't I don't think I would ever run out of desire. I'm not a guy that, you know, like Mark is dialed into the moose and, and caribou primarily because they're those northern species. I'm not a guy that dials into one. I'm kind of a you know not a jack of all trades, but I, I am an opportunist. And I enjoy getting out there and just seeing those new things, you know, and the, and the reason that Mark does that is because it, obviously that's your market. So I can't explain it. <laughs> He's an charismatic <laughs> megafauna. My, my son <laughs> called me a few nights ago. We were talking, just finishing off the night together, catching up and he's like, I don't think it's an obsession, Dad, but it's it's almost yeah, it borderline, Dad, borderline the antlers, the obsession with the antlers. It's just I I don't know why. I'm and, gonna agree with Andrew. If you took a month off of <laughs> antlered animals, you would you would need to go through a twelve step program. But no, I love bears. I love wolves. I love all kinds of, and I do honestly appreciate. I love walking in the woods right now, and like. A couple of a pair of white breasted nut hatches, you know, chirping away on the tree beside me. The smallest things I, I do enjoy. It's just I've always photographed antlered animals and that's done well and I can't get enough of taking how pictures many of images of a white breasted nut hatch do you have? None. I only have one. <laughs> but I loved I love seeing them on the walk. All the all bird life. The warblers coming through in the spring, I could just sit and watch them for an hour. But I'm not driven to photograph them because it's it's an undertaking. You, I, my philosophy, and it may not be something that everybody subscribes to, but you need to build a kick-butt portfolio for any of these species you want to create images that will generate revenue. Agreed. And to be good enough at that is a commitment. And I simply enjoy all the other wonders of nature on planet Earth, but don't have the time or energy to want to build a portfolio on them that I believe would compete with what's out there. So I have my niche that I focus on, but I love it all. But yeah, if absolutely, I, I hear you. And I've, I've known wonderful photographers that photograph all aspects of, of nature and do well at it. So yeah, I, it is I, tough to be tougher to be a generalist because, you know, I shared a while back on a 
podcast, what, a couple months ago, that um, my goal is to go out there and get that, you know, that one image every trip. I want one that just knocks your socks off. But if you're a generalist photographer and you're not doing those things time and time and time again, it's very difficult to come back with that image because you you just don't spend the time that it you know that it takes to get that portfolio image. So yeah, I understand that for sure. Well, I was just gonna say it's time. I mean, it you said time. time and energy, Mark, but I think we all have the energy, right? It's mostly just the time. It's mm. how can you go to Africa and do it justice if you want to do all the charismatic megafauna that exists in your own backyard? That being North America, I mean, it's just it's hard. It just how do you do it? But just seeing those places is something to. Yeah, that being said, the the migration is that's just one of those experiences that I'd like to have. Not necessarily an individual species because there's so many, mm. but that just that experience of seeing that biomass move all at the same time, I think it, it would be overwhelming for my senses. Yeah, it learns so much just with oh, yeah, it. for sure. I think I said that on a podcast the other day, or didn't I talk about that? Where we were in Africa, and in the morning we left, and we traveled down this two track from a campsite. And the wildebeest were crossing the road. We came back that night, and they were still crossing the road. Yeah, that's so crazy. who knows how many were going? You know how many traveled through there, but it was pretty much nonstop all day long. Yeah. How about you, yeah. Jason? Well, I was just going to say I would agree with what Mark said. I mean, that's the. But I try to balance it. I guess I try to balance it with some new experiences, and I'm not necessarily going to photograph and try to build a portfolio. But to definitely go try to have those experiences, you know, and, and witness some of those things. Um, but, yeah, I think for me, to answer the question more directly, um, I'm going to take a little bit different spin on it. I'm going to say, you know, the the polar bears and the um, some of that stuff are, are high on the list for me. It's been overdone, like you said, Ron, but I've, I've never done it for me. And I don't care. I'm going to have the experience. Um, but one that I have been actively trying to photograph that I haven't been able to photograph yet is a bobcat. And that sucker has been a nemesis for me. And I've had some close calls and it just has not come together yet. And, I, and I'm confident that it will eventually. But, um, you know, it's a lot of time and opportunities out there trying to do it. But uh, that's one that has really been nagging at me and uh, a, a wild bobcat just doing its thing with good light. I mean, it's got to, everything's got to come together, right? Um, I've seen them in the wild. I've just never actually gotten a decent photo of one. So that's how I'd answer. For me, I don't know. I mean, for a long time, it was always a snow leopard, but that is almost, I don't know. I mean, you, you talk to, I've talked to several guys who have actually filmed them and most of that is coming out of camera traps just because they're so elusive, it's just so difficult. But we interviewed, who was it, Brad Josephs on this podcast, and he was doing some tours over there, and they were getting shots of them. You know, it might take seven or eight days, and you might get two or three encounters over a seven, ten-day period. And they were shooting at 800 yards or 1,000 yards. So you're not, you know, you're dealing with atmospheric, you know, problems. So you're not going to really ever get a clear shot. So you're going to have to do the camera trap stuff. So I don't know if that's, that would be the one thing, but while you're there, you could possibly do Marco Polo sheep, which would be pretty cool too. If you go up another 10,000 feet. <laughs> exactly. Right. So those are two that are kind of high Marco on my Polo list. sheep and Himalayan tar. Yeah. And a lot of the ibex species, I mean, there's so many species yeah. of ibex out there, and you see some really awesome images from Europe all over the place where they those species exist, and they're in that really cool country, and they just have just such cool look to them. One of my favorite African animals is the sable, and mm -hmm. if you've ever seen that sable with those big old horns that are just like so prominent, those are cool too. So, I, you know, it, it's just too hard to say exactly one species is out there yeah exactly mark how about you well i i would love to, i haven't had the polar bear experience either jason and it's it's right near the top of the list and has come close on two occasions but 
one species that comes to mind right now that I'd love to have a relatively close encounter to photograph that I have seen in the wild but never photographed well is a wolverine. Mm. Just because of how they resonate, how they're, re- they're not nomadic, but the huge territories they have, the chance of encountering one, and then the symbolism of the species, the power, the misunderstanding to some degree, just the encounter would be one of those thrills of a lifetime to me. There was a close call in the back country of Denali National Park in Alaska that I had about seven or eight years ago. I was on a permit and I had my friend Jason with me. Uh, we went to wildlife biology, studied wildlife biology together. And we were driving past, as you know, in Denali, there are a lot of buses that will take people in, tourists to see the park, to see the megafauna, to see the mountains, to see the, the vistas. And there was this bus pulled over on the side of Polychrome Pass, which is an iconic part of the roadway back in Denali. And there was a wolf pack in that area, a rendezvous site near there. So on this permit that we were in there, the nine days in the backcountry, we knew the wolves were around. And we were heading out that day to refuel, I guess. And there was a bus pulled over the side of the road. So I slowed down and, and it was on Jason's side at the passenger. He looked out the window and I said, do you see anything? Just out of curiosity. And he says, so yeah, there's a wolf down there going through the, through the willows. I was like, oh, awesome. And so we looked for a second. I didn't see it. And because the bus was there, we pulled on. We went maybe half a mile and Jason says, does a wolf have a white stripe down the lower part of its side? <laughs> It was like, what? Breaks. <laughs> and then it turned out there were, there was a family of like three wolverines that had been hanging around that, that basin. And so it was close, close, wow. but didn't happen. So that's, that's my species of choice. If I could have that experience. <laughs> I think that totally speaks all of these are, it's time, right? You know, wolverines would be I think it's doable. I think you could say in 2021, I want to get a picture of Wolverine, but I think you could say I need to spend 60 days Mm -hmm. focused 100% on that because you need to find the situation where it would be the most prevalent. And I know those places. I know where those places are at. It's just, it's not like a moose where you can go and pretty much count on seeing one every day. You know they're going to travel through there, but you just got to put in the time. So have you guys have you guys seen the the series on Discovery called Alone or is it might be History Channel I don't know forgive me but mm-hmm. it's Alone the survival show on um, I think most of those episodes when they're up in that area they generally one or two of them end up having encounters with wolverines yeah. so you, to your point you know they're out there 50 60 days in a row and they have one or two encounters yeah so I, you're right you're spot on i think Harlan and i joked about it like we need to sign up for that show just so we can get take our cameras and <laughs> have a wolverine encounter you know but <laughs> yeah it was uh well and i think we've talked about this before but there was one in uh, custer state park in south dakota and there's you know it's foothills basically compared to what wolverines are known to inhabit but it was right out in the plains Went up, stood up on a, a tour vehicle, stood up on the side of it, gave everybody a good iPhone shot, shooting down the side of the vehicle. They're they're all over. In North Dakota, there's been wolverines in North Dakota this this fall. So they're they're around. It's just they're always on the move, so it's tough to I have another story in. like that. There was a guy in uh Rocky Mountain National Park cruising up uh there's a one dirt road in that park that you can drive up to the high alpine and he was on that road and looked over and he thought it was a marmot right because who thinks you're going to see a wolverine in colorado i mean yeah they're here but uh, you know the chances of seeing one so he looked over and it thought it was a yellow-bellied marmot and lo and behold it was a wolverine and he was able to photograph it and he got to talking to the biologist there and it had traveled from yellowstone it had been uh, it didn't have a radio collar on it, but it had a satellite tracker on it. And that thing came all the way from Yellowstone to Rocky Mountain National Park. That's at least an eight-hour drive for me driving. So what did it take him? You know, it could go as quickly as 10, 15 days, or it could be six months that he just kind of piddled around and made his way down there. It's crazy. 
Good one. Rabbit holes. The the the, the, um, the radio tracking stuff is is illuminated some amazing treks at some animals, lynx, wolves, across sharks. What you know? It's it's something to see how far some of these species go sometimes. Yeah. And then as a biologist or people like wild and exposed hosts and listeners who just love this stuff, you just have to sit back and think, why? What's the motivation for these animals to go so far? Is it is it like us? I just want to see what's on the other side of the hill or is there some other reason? But it's, it's I don't know. I think about that stuff. They're interesting maybe, stuff. Maybe there it's too. just me. The, the great white sharks that they're doing that with. You guys probably mm-hmm. saw those Circum, stories last year. Circum- navigate the globe, yeah. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's incredible. It's awesome. So that, was next good, que- that was a good Sorry. question. Sorry. Yeah, well, uh, definitely. Yeah. Thanks for sending that one in. The next question is from Tyson Dearden underscore photography. So T-Y-S-O-N Tyson D-E-A-R-D-E-N underscore photography. What pack do you all prefer for your gear? Jason. Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I get the pun. Sorry. Um, so actually, I don't have a pack. I I have kind of a problem with bags. My wife will tell you that I'm the kind of person that thinks I need a bag for every situation. So um, I will I will narrow it down to my two favorite most used bags, and one is the Mindshift Gear Bag. I think it's a I can't remember the model. I'll have to get that information and we can put it in the show notes. Um, it's their larger one that um, will carry a 500 or 600 millimeter lens in it without the body attached. Um, and then the other one is an F-stop gear. F-stop gear has been one of my favorite packs. I love their system. I had the mind shift gear pack first, but the F-stop gear pack came later. I bought the larger one with the multiple ICUs, which that's their interchangeable camera units is what they call what they stand what that stands for and they come in multiple sizes so you could pretty much have one bag and different camera units depending on what you're going to be shooting and where you're going so this the bigger bag they have has a lot of extra room for coats and gear and other stuff other than just camera equipment where i like that about this bag more than the mind shift gear bag because the mind shift gear bag is very limited to just kind of what kind of camera gear you can carry or what kind of gear you can kind of shove in the camera unused camera gear compartments so for me that's kind of where i've landed for now i haven't had another bag that's caught my mind i will say the only other one is an, it's actually a mind shift gear bag too when traveling and yeah, they have a roll away it's it's a uh, it's for, uh, it'll fit in checked luggage, or not checked, I'm sorry. It'll fit in the carry-on requirements, and it'll actually carry a larger lens. I don't think it'll carry a 600, but it'll carry a 500, and um, it'll carry quite a bit of equipment. Um, and that's a pretty nice, heavy-duty, um, roll-away travel bag for my camera gear. So when I am going to be traveling and I can't take, which I don't know if you guys have heard some of the new restrictions that they're coming up with, but Salt Lake City Airport just got completely revamped. And I haven't been to the airport yet, but a friend of mine, Kelly, was recently there, and he mentioned that they've got it all automated now. When you go through security, if your bag doesn't fit in the carry-on requirements, that you it has to be checked, period, end of story. There's none of this, you know, give and take, and, well, they'll let that one slide, apparently. So if you're, if you're carrying a backpack and think you're just going to carry it on and, and take it with you, that ain't going to happen anymore. You're going to you're gonna have to check that. So that's good to know, and depending on the airport, I'm sure, but at least at Salt Lake now, that's the case. So I would I would be you know not taking the backpack necessarily as a carry on item, and I would be taking that roll away, for example, that fits in the carry on requirements. So I'm this yeah this could go down a really long rabbit hole I know. So I'll leave it at that. That's the three. I said two. There's the three main bags that I use. <laughs> yeah, I think this could be a whole podcast in itself. It probably, yeah, for sure. probably should be at some point. I hadn't heard that. And, I, you know, back in the day, that would scare me because I I would stand when I was handing my ticket to board the plane. I would make sure I had my shoulders as wide as I could. They couldn't see how big my backpack was. It's like, <laughs> and don't touch it. Don't try to lift it, you know. Yeah. It's oh, just, yeah. <laughs> so if, if it's going to be an automated system, I mean, I've made it smaller. And, and this is something with the whole, not that I'm mirrorless, like you fancy guys 
but with the smaller kits, it's now doable without much stress to fit in to carry on. But yeah, back in the day, and if yeah, if it's automated, you, you definitely want to know. You don't want to be at that point where you're boarding the plane or or going through security and and have it rejected. Yeah. Through, yeah, I would just say, right, caution to all of us, if as you're getting ready to go on your next trip, and if you haven't traveled for a while, like me, it's been almost a year now, you just might want to check into some of those requirements, especially if you're taking your camera gear. But. Well, let me just pick up off of that one. So let me get into that travel thing first, and then we can go into the bag. So I can see him doing that, and it makes sense. And if you travel in Europe, they test that. I mean, you do have to do that. I've been, you know, early on, I'm the same as you, Mark. Nobody touches my stuff, but I've gotten very much more lax over the over the years with that. But no, you, sorry. I didn't mean it that way. It was just too heavy. No, but I know, but they weigh them in Europe. They yeah. weigh your carry okay. on. All right. When right I went on. and did polar bears, you know, you you fly into, I think, Winnipeg, and right. then I went from Winnipeg to Churchill. Right. Well, same thing. You think you're gonna you know, fly under the radar? Uh, they look, they weighed my carry-ons they, and I had to pay. I was able to get it on the plane, but I had to pay extra because of the weight of my camera stuff. And when you're taking a red and you're taking all the batteries and everything that's required to do it, your best bet is to have a photo assistant with you if you're trying to, you know, in that case, you know, if you're doing a, a job for somebody, then of course you could take an assistant and that's how you get all your gear there. But yeah, that's more and more common. Now, the flip side to that is, is I choose all my flights based off of the plane that I'm going to fly on because I fly in so many, so many different airplanes that you just know, okay, if it's a CRJ 700, it's a, no, it's not going to happen. The, the smallest, that 1510 Pelican case will fit, but they will argue with you. <laughs> and then you just got to figure out, is it worth arguing? And the reason I take a Pelican case is because if I do have to check it, at least I know I can zip lock or zip tie the, the, where you would put a lock and then send it in the back of the plane. And if it's in a Pelican, it's going to be pretty safe. Um, I won't do that with a soft-sided backpack or something. I won't let them check that on just because you can't. You know, the, you, who knows what how it's going to get stacked in the back and what's going to be put on top of it and all that jazz. So if you know, and it'd be interesting, I bet you there's a website out there that would give you the newer planes. If you're on a newer plane, the luggage compartments are so much bigger now. Because I travel with that airport security bag by think tank and it's a roller bag it does have some backpack straps on it that you can you know if you are somewhere where you need to transfer transform it into a backpack you can it's super uncomfortable but if you were just going through an airport or something you need your hands free you could do it but those that's like the biggest bag that can possibly fit in an overhead compartment but the newer and the older planes it was sketchy you know i'd have to like systematically pack what was inside the bag so that I knew when I got on there, I could push it as far forward as I could. I'd just be smashing it into that thing. So you didn't put a camera body at the very top of it. You put in stuff that could be smashed a little bit. And then I, before I sit down, I always close the door just to make sure, because you don't want to have the whole plane loaded and then have the flight attendant come down and try to shut that door and it's not going to shut. And it's your bag that's holding it up. What well, guess what's going to happen? They're going to take that bag and say, you need to gate check this. So um, just pick and choose your planes, and I'll bet you there's a website out there that would give you more of that information. In fact, that would be cool if Think Tank or someone like that, and maybe they do. Maybe they say this is this bag will work on this particular airplane. But it's just something to I fight with all the time. But I've got much more lax on over the years with it. But as far as the bags that I use, I use low. I use mind shift i use f-stop one i've never used but i always wanted to get one and i just haven't have you guys seen the ones called gura gear yep and i sold it you didn't like it the the one that i had was just a little bit too small oh. i think there's several different models but the problem with the way that they have it set up is you end up with inevitably more weight on one side so by the time you get to the top or to the bottom or wherever you're headed, your backs and your back and hips are, yeah, yeah. One side is taking the brunt of the punishment. I think it would be a good safari bag because it's going to give you the space to do 
a big lens on one side. It's kind of it's not it's non traditional, right? It doesn't unzip and have the whole flap come open. It it's kind of split down the middle and half opens one way and half opens the other way. So you could put a long lens down one side and then all your other stuff on the other side. And they're super thin too, so they're not bulky as far as construction, which makes it a little bit better. So if you can babysit that thing, I think it'd be great. Like, and if you're on a safari, which you're not going to be walking around, if you're going to be sitting in a vehicle the whole time, that would be a good one. I just picked up an older, I think it's a low 600 AW all weather. Is low pro? Yeah. Is different yeah. than low? Low pro. Low pro. Low yeah. pro. Okay. That's what I have. Super huge bag. It's gigantic. But it's awesome because I can take, when I'm shooting video, I can take a big lens, I can take the red, I can take the batteries, I can take everything I need. The problem is, is you got to be super in shape to carry that sucker for any mm -hmm. length of time because you can just, you can, there's so much space that you can overload it to the point where it's no fun to be carrying it around. So the thing that I do like about it is you can take some of those dividers out and you can put, you know, your extra layers, you can put your food in there yeah. as well, even if you're only taking one body. And it has a sleeve for your tripod. Yep. Um, so it's set up as a photo bag, but it is definitely not. And this is my problem with photo bags, and this is how I would answer the question. I, I don't like them. They're not made to pack. They're made to carry camera gear. And if you look at a, you know, a trekking-type backpack, ergonomically they're set up completely different than any camera bag out there and there's been a couple people there's one guy that i was real excited about he's he's from wyoming but he had he was working with a european backpack producer and he basically queried you know 10 or 12 different photographers what would you put in this bag had it all set up and i i they were to the point where he was ready to go into production and then all of a sudden it kind of fell off the map. So I'd like to, you know, dig in and see if they ever did produce anything, you know, as far as mass production. I know he had some prototypes that he was working with and it looked slick, the system that he had. And I was hoping that it would, you know, it'd be something that I would have in my hand by now. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, the ICUs that Jason was talking about earlier you can throw those in a regular backpack that's actually made to to pack with and carry your camera gear and and it's it's secure and it's safe it's not shifting around but i have been guilty of just taking my regular backpack and wrapping my camera gear up in some clothing and s sticking it in there so it doesn't shift around you know so you've got a, a good manageable load and just going with that too but it's definitely not made for that it's definitely not the system to go with if you're going to be going for days on end i think the f-stop that jason talked about is probably the closest thing to a traditional you know backcountry backpack mm -hmm. as yeah. far as the suspension system and all that stuff and then if you yeah. do have those icus that you can move around i've also tried uh, companies like sitka and stone glacier and kuyu because they'll make high performance packs for hunters that are like sheep hunting and they're putting on 10, 15 miles a day. And so they've got these very, very uh, lightweight, sturdy, suspension good systems. suspensions. It's carbon fiber, you know, frames, all this kind of stuff. So they're super light, but it's what you just said, Ron. It's not necessarily set up for photos. So then I fashioned my own divider system that went in there and that worked. So, I mean, I don't think I've found the, the perfect bag. And I don't think you ever will because everybody's different and everybody carries different things and you do different, you set up differently. I, I just don't know that. I mean, it would be tough to be a, a backpack manufacturer and try to produce the best, per, most perfect backpack. This could, mm -hmm. you're, you guys are all right in that this could be a whole podcast because the question, I mean, if you're going on a plane trip, that's one thing. If you're doing a multi-day backcountry trip, that's a whole different pack set up thought process altogether 100 right. percent different right because you, you can't carry multiple packs so if you break it down that way it, it's a lot of conversation so all, all right. right so this will be the next three questions <laughs> 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 it makes sense i mean for yep. the multi-day stuff that's really important but then yeah and then if you're 
in a kayak or a canoe or whatever. Well, I was just so, going to say that. But for someone like you, Mark, you do a lot of like canoeing. Mm -hmm. But then you got the whole portage, which is a whole different, like you're still going to carry that stuff. So it's not like you can just have one bag that you throw in the canoe. You're still going to have to carry it at some point. And it could be, a, what, two or three miles. Yeah, but there are, there, I can't find them right now because a good friend of mine who comes on a lot of my trips wanted to get a different dry bag. And Mountain Equipment Co-op in Canada was selling these, and now they're not. And we haven't found them a replacement. But there's a dry bag that has that backpacker system, suspension system, that's really comfortable. And the bag is, uh, I, I can put a picture up. On, on for the show notes and stuff, but it seals perfectly, but it's not quick access. I mean, it doesn't take too long, but you've got all other gear in it. So on trips like that, I'll put a small camera bag in that big dry bag backpack. Or if I'm shooting from the canoe, then, then it's, you know, just a small camera bag near me and hope it doesn't get wet. Cross your yep. fingers. Different system, but yeah, I've, I've had many low pro bags of different size and formats over the years that I've enjoyed, but I haven't purchased a bag in five or six years. So the newer ones, like you guys are mentioning, I haven't experimented with the, as far as a traditional camera backpack, I have lots of I have some new, I have an Osprey hiking backpack and then this dry bag that are both really good. But for a camera bag, the one I've used for the last five years or so everywhere is a think tank one that does fit for carry on and it fits enough stuff and it has an, an outer pouch on it that kind of balloons out so i can put enough day gear in there as far as clothing and there's some um, nalgene pockets on the side or clip-ons i can make it work for a day hike multi-day no that wouldn't happen but for airport and and trips where we're we're camping and, and have a home base that way or out of a cabin it's work think tank but low pro but yeah there's so many options now but i i've heard more and more about those those camera unit ones and i mean michael's been building his own in the pelican cases forever too mm -hmm. yeah yeah you get that little divider system works pretty good but it's mm -hmm. not good for you know you said earlier if i do a hard case or if i do a roller bag that i'm gonna take through an airport oftentimes i got a backpack in my checked-in luggage because you got to you got to transfer everything to be mobile when you get to wherever you're going. So it, it there's no perfect answer for it. All right. Well, thanks for listening to today's question podcast. <laughs> <laughs> <Listener> question. <laughs> Another good, great question. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. We'll jump back to there's, Canoe underscore carrier. This question, do you use social media? Well, I meant jump back to Instagram for a moment or social media. Do you use social media to find composition trends to avoid or use in your own work? Michael? I use both. You know, I, I, I do. it's a lot of inspiration out there. You know, so, but I'm not going to go copy a picture. You know, I'm not, you know, what is the big thing now where they have places in national parks where it's stand here and you'll get this picture. <laughs> I'm not doing that, but I do love seeing other, I mean, I think it's just good. I think it's just good inspiration. If you can get an idea and then twist it and make it your own, that's, that's the best. So I love doing it. And the things that you avoid is the stuff that is just, everybody does, right? So much of the stuff that I follow, like in Canada with all those beautiful lakes and the big mountains and one person standing on a rock, you know, you just see thousands of those. So definitely not going to do that. But it is beautiful. So I know I want to go there. I just want to get my own take on it. Jason, Instagram, inspiration visually or? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's right. I think it's, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd answer it much different. I, I definitely use it. I definitely look at, there's lots of people that I follow that I see their images and you guys included that inspire me and, and give me ideas on how to do things. But I definitely don't want to try to just copy, you know, copy paste. I definitely want to try to make it my own. So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, a lot of, I don't know. It's hard, right? It's hard to say how many caribou pictures are there out there? How many moose images are there out there? And trying to, trying to make it a different, unique perspective is not an easy thing to do with those kind of critters that have been photographed so much. 
but it's i still believe it's doable you've just got to really be creative so that's that's what i would say absolutely i get lots of inspiration on both how and how not to do it to be quite honest <laughs> for my personal taste but makes sense totally ron <laughs> <laughs> They get a break. No. I just, I just look at you guys' Instagram pages and then I try to go. One eighty. Find, find the same critter. <laughs> no, I think I, I'm not a super creative person. When you get right down to it, so I definitely draw inspiration from other photographers. But in the end, while you know we all experiment with different things here and there, I think. I have, you develop your own style, uh, but that style definitely can be influenced by people, whether you think about it, you know, it's conscious or, or subconscious influence. Uh, when you get out in the field and you start thinking, you know, like, uh, just as an example, Michael recently posted a Eagle image from our trip to Alaska last year into the spring of 2019. And, uh, I've shared before, I think even on the podcast, I we got back to the room that night and we're looking through images and I thought, man, I just killed this for the next few days. I can just work on whatever. And then I looked at what Mike got and I'm like, yep, starting over. <laughs> oh, I because, think you got a bunch of good stuff out of that though. Oh, it, it was a phenomenal trip. I'm going to throw a coin in the swear jar and use phenomenal because it... <laughs> It truly was. It was amazing the opportunities that we ended up having. Um, but I, you know, there were some things that happened. They happened so fast that you don't even really know they're happening until you get back and and look at them on camera. And the just timing. I mean, Michael had the experience up there. Obviously, he'd been there before, and knowing how to time when these birds turn and. If they see something, they're going to go after the look in their eye and then just watch and just wait for them to react. When they turn vertically, that's the shot. And not knowing that, I mean, my whole emphasis on the first day was to catch them hitting, hitting the water after a fish. And while, yeah, that's it's cool. It's great to see them use their tail as a rudder and all that kind of the little intricacies there the real highlight action was in the air and I wasn't getting it. And so you draw inspiration, not only from other photographers and their creative process, but also from the people that have been there before. And, you know, we all know, and we all talk about all the time, those behaviors, you don't know what you don't know. So I didn't know what behaviors I was missing until I saw it firsthand. And I was there standing right next to the guy that was capturing it. And I didn't see it happening. So, you know, for those reasons, I, I would say yes, definitely. But I think I draw more inspiration from just being in the field and, you know, seeing how other people, you know, shooting with, with Mark as far as behavior and predicting behavior, shooting with Michael and, you know, the things that we just talked about and Jason and the stinking light, just, you know, he heads off in a direction that there's no shot there to me at the time and then all of a sudden boom you get this crazy light in in these images of this place you're standing right next to him so i think that's where probably the inspiration comes for me more than social media i don't know if it answered the question specifically but i skirted around it great answer no oh, love it love it there's a lot to that well i think it's it just speaks to time again right it just keeps going back to time because the reason I was getting the images I was getting is because of time. I've been there so many times and you just kind of dial in on it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, you know, it's, that's where I think like workshops come in really handy because you get to learn a lot of that stuff without having to spend that time, but you got to spend the money to mm -hmm. go take the workshop. <laughs> hey, Mark, yeah, don't somebody... move. You had the perfect like little outline of the, there you go. See, right. Oh yeah. That's, very Pick artistic. your left ear up, just right there. Whoa, whoa. 
All right. <laughs> don't, guess don't. you're going to have to go to YouTube, people. I'm not sure what the guys are doing right now, but I have to sit still. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting nope, whispering sweet nothings in your ear right now. Uh, all, he's always doing that. No, this is this is on so, a whole nother level. <laughs> landscape photographers would tell you to look for the S curves. And if you look at Mark's image online right now on YouTube, you see that nice S curve coming down by the shovel of the caribou and off to Mark's left shoulder. It's perfect. You could print that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rabbit hole. All right, guys. All right. <laughs> workshops who wants to come and see caribou with me oh that's a future conversation um that's a non-covid so, conversation yes yes you know and when i heard that the vaccinations might of course that's a big word right now might all be finished by september then it might happen this fall news coming out down the road for a very limited opportunity anyways the Instagram, I, I, Instagram has the most variety of image content of anything imaginable. Everything across the spectrum from any subject to, and right aqua, across the quality spectrum as well. So what I think about, about Instagram is a lot like, I guess you have to filter it for quality for those that aspire to improve their game as photographers when i was young and the idea caught on like wildfire that i wanted to be do my best to be a professional photographer i trained my eyes by looking at every publication i could every book on the subjects that i was drawn to every magazine again and again and again and again and i think to get started that trained my eye for composition because I knew there was no point in trying to create a portfolio that wasn't as good as what I was seeing in publications if I hoped to sell to those publications. It had to be similar at the very least. I aspired to be of the quality that I was seeing out there. Instagram can serve that purpose now. And the trick is filtering what you look at to those talented photographers, professional or not, whose work you love. And would like to create and like michael pointed out it's not a matter of necessarily repetition it's that subtle training over seeing work at time and learning light and shadows like jason's an expert at just train your eye to how that's done and think about it so that there's a neurological connection when you're in the field and maybe you've blasted those first 10 shots of whatever the subject is that's in front of you because it's right there. You've put it in the picture. Maybe it's center frame. Who knows? But after you've collected those first ones and you just pause for a moment and think creatively what's next, then you start to make those mental connections to what you've seen, what you've trained your eye with those photographers who you follow on Instagram that aspire you aspire to and you will start to create more imagery like that. So I think when you filter Instagram correctly and, you know, maybe you've got 15 or 20 photographers that cover the content, the subject matter that you love and, and train yourself that way. I, I don't think there's really a better tool out there now that's as accessible as, as Instagram. And for me, it's still that way. There are photographers. I, you know, I love that part about Instagram and, Shout out to my wild and exposed co-hosts and to many other photographers that I admire out there that I like nothing more. It's a rush on Instagram in the sense that we're going through so many images like, 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 don't like, like comment. This one's a good one. I'm going to comment on it. You know, I'm Mr. Emoji. At least I'll take a moment and hit a camera and a couple of thumbs up because this picture stopped me for that moment. But then there's the one that you actually do stop on and it spends some time looking at. We've talked about it multiple times on the podcast over the past three years, but that image, when you stop, then it, there's a reason that it has stopped you. What is that reason? Dissect it a little bit, think about it, and maybe save it in your little, and just remember that. And it will, I think, I believe, train people to become better photographers for composition 
And from what I see on Instagram, more importantly than composition, reading light for good light, whether it's overcast or sunny conditions and when that occurs and how to position yourself in the best situation to create the type of images you like. So I think it's an amazing tool, Instagram is, but it doesn't come with an instructional booklet, right? It's a matter of just picking where you spend your time to learn and, and to become a better photographer by by studying those photographs of, of inspirational people out there. And then it'll happen with, as the guys have said, with time, repetition and time in the field. So that's my, it's, it's, it's inspirational. And at the same time, you know, yeah, there's definitely a bunch of people I, I follow for that purpose and, and see great outstanding images from all the time. All right, next next question, guys. I had one lined up here that was, yeah, here it is. Um, kind of spins off of what Ron was saying. Jimmy C underscore nine from Instagram asked, when do you know you nailed the shot? Or do you ever think that you nailed it? I assume that means when you're right there in the field with the camera. Are you like high-fiving yourself? So when do you know you nailed the shot or do you ever think you nailed it for the guy who's mastered light where the elk is set up against the black background and it's pitch black and the elk is on fire in the light jason when do you know you've nailed the shot or do you think that way in the field you know i think it's dangerous to think that way in the field that's the first thing that comes to mind for me um i've had so many opportunities where I've I've thought I've had the shot, so to speak, and I realize after I get it back and on the computer that I didn't quite get it. Something was wrong. Technically, maybe it wasn't quite sharp. Maybe it didn't. I cut off a, a foot or who knows, whatever it might be. So I try not to think that way at all in the field. And then what I've also learned is that I, don't, I probably am the person now that doesn't ever really think I've ever nailed the shot. And I, and I just mean that from a sense that if I'm really trying to improve and make myself better, even the shots that I think are pretty awesome, the, if I really get critical about it, there's things that there's always things that could have been better, could have been different. Could have, I've, I've, if I'd have just done this, if I'd have just waited one more, if I'd have started the shutter button a little, whatever it is that just, you know, the ear wasn't quite right. You, you could go on and on and on. But yeah, so for me, um, I don't. I try not to think that way at all in the field because I think it's dangerous. And I try to try to in the in the spirit of trying to be continuously improving myself. I try to always critique my images myself and try to see what could I have done better, differently to make it even better. If that makes sense. So that's that. I think that's how I'd answer it. And I miss I miss a, a lot, a lot of shots. Trust me, a lot. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> yeah, Ditto. Exactly. I think I would just reiterate everything you just said. Yeah, that was a perfect answer. I have a good story around that. So um, in Denali, we were on a, one of the road permits, and there happened to be a moose kill, and it was a pack of wolves. And it was a big moose, right? Moose are huge. So these wolves are going to feed on that moose for quite a while. So this thing we were able to photograph for, I don't know, it was like two and a half days. And you have wolves in front of you for two and a half days at like 40, 50, 60 yards, right? So we happened to be in a good area where we could be really close. There was a ranger there with us, so it was all co it was cool with the park service. And I can remember thinking, how many times in my life is this ever going to happen again? I am never going to think I nail anything here. I'm going to shoot till I have... This was in the film days, but... I probably had 200 rolls. Of, I always took 200 rolls of film with me. I'm not going to quit shooting until all the film's gone or the wolves are gone. Cause I didn't think I was nailing it. You know, I just don't think that I felt like, or if I did, I didn't know. Of course, back then you couldn't review your images, but how many times are you going to have this situation? So I'm going to just keep shooting until something changes where mostly the wolves are going to leave or the bear, you know, there were wolves and bears and all kinds of stuff coming in. So I think it's just, that's always been my attitude. I don't ever feel like I nailed it ever. 
I just keep shooting. And yeah, there might be one or two or three that come out of there that are pretty, pretty awesome, but I'm not going to rest on those laurels at all. I'm just going to keep going. Just never think you got it. And on Ron and I's trip to do Eagles, I mean, that was the epitome of that too, right? 10,000 images later. Yep. We didn't nail it. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see you guys got a few. Yeah, yeah, you got to take a, few, a lot without but... changing light and action. But yeah, you did. Yeah. And that's a that's what I was going to say, you know, to Jason's comment earlier. I think too often I've been the guy that thought I got it. And you learn from the <laughs> learn from those times when you get home and actually because looking at it on the back of your camera where it's showing you basically a JPEG rendition of what you actually captured. And then you get home and it's like, ah, crap. (laughs) You know, you could be the, yeah, I got that. (laughs) And then you get back and you should have, you should have continued to pursue perfection in that, you know, and you've I, uh, got that image in front of you and you're like, none, none of these Topaz modules will even fix this for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Topaz can fix this. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I think that that is on, on the other hand, I think it's good to mature in your shooting and get to the point where you're never satisfied because it can always be a little bit better. You know, Mark, you talk about work in the situation all the time and changing your composition, changing your, you know, metering differently. So you're getting a little bit different light, exposing the the situation a little bit different, trying to just change an angle. Even sometimes a foot, two feet can make a ton of difference with cleaning up a background, but just never being satisfied with that while you've got it in front of you. Because let's be honest, I mean, Mike's point about the wolves in Alaska None of these things will ever happen in our lifetime again. We're never going to have this exact situation ever. So we've got to take advantage of it when we, while we can. And that's the, the fun part of wildlife photography. It's never going to be repeated. So right. just capture it. Digitally, you can just keep spinning that yep. shutter or, and just you know, collect all kinds of images and experiment and you know, often what I think might be the best image from an experience doesn't turn out to be when it gets back to the editing table and back to the computer. But, um, yeah, I, sorry, I'm getting back to the question here. Let me revisit. Um, I, yeah, I, I think Jason's answer was a hundred percent bang on and it's, it's, it's risky and too cocky to think that it's been nailed in the field i think when an amazing thing experience happens and i'm able to be there to try to capture images of it that's the thrill that keeps me going back for more and i hope i got it but i never i never never think that it's a sure thing until i'm finished editing the raw through the process I really hope so. There are moments it's like, and I, I a part of me doesn't want to look for a bit. You know, I do because it's digital. <laughs> you got to check or if there's an opportunity to repeat. But it's like, I really, 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 really hope that turned out the way I think it should. But yeah. not, I don't keep, tie my heartstrings to it until the editing process is over. There was, there was a picture. Here's a funny one. And it did turn out to be fantastic. And I've never taken a perfect picture. I, I, you look at images, and there's always like, oh, this could be different, this could be that. But that's because we were there in the experience. We saw what happened. you know. And I think all photographers, all artists that create this stuff might be most critical because you know, a painter sees every brush stroke that they did, perhaps, whereas the person that's purchasing it and admiring it isn't looking at all those fine details, but looking at the overall impact of the piece of art or the photograph and are taking away that that big impression, but we see all the aspects to it. And I had a caribou on my first trip to Alaska. There were three caribou bulls on a ridge and it was totally dark clouds. It was, and it was, okay. I, 
It's equivalent to the swear jar. I'll put my coin in it. <laughs> Slide days. <laughs> so we were very limited what we could do. So we were just watching because it was too dark for the speed of the film. But then this little band of clouds separated and the sh shaft of light came through and hit this caribou and he was shedding his velvet. So he had these dreadlocks of velvet hanging and blood all over his antlers. I'm just pausing because I'm wondering if I told this story a long time ago on the podcast or not. But it was the light was spectacular. And I just like, oh, I so hope that turned out. I hope I exposed it properly to capture that richness of color. Because if you overexpose it, forget about it. If it's too dark, it slides. You get what you get. Back then, with oh, I love the, the mirrorless with what you see is what you get now. <laughs> anyway, everything was perfect for light. I had to wait for three weeks, I think, before I saw the image. It turned out great. And I'd sent it. No, I, I'd seen this before I sent it. But I sent it to a magazine that ended up running it as a two-page spread. But everything was fantastic about the image. But the caribou bull had just stood up from being bedded for a few hours. And when animals do that, they usually relieve themselves in one way or another, one, number one or number two. And I had no idea this was happening during the photos when I was taking it. But there's this golden stream caught in the light <laughs> <laughs> coming in front of the back legs. Of, everything about this picture was perfect. This is pre-digital. There's no option to this. It was like, this is what you get. And the magazine loves spinning. They, they purchased it anyway, thankfully. But they like that part of the humor of the story. But and again, so, yeah, never assume anything's turned out. It's just, it's a tr there are these highlight experiences that I think we hold on to from a photo shoot. And then when we finish the edit, we can breathe a sigh of relief and say, yes, it is as powerful an image as we hoped it would be. But mm -hmm. that is not always the case. So, yeah, I think it's naive to, to assume we've nailed it in the field. It, um, it's more for me of it wasn't that an incredible experience. And then, you know, and sharing it with people is also another thing that's super important when that happens. Love the memories with when can we do our next trip, guys? <laughs> Hold Not on, before we get on to that, I got one more <laughs> thing to say on that. When you think you've nailed the shot and you're sitting there chimping, you're Rated. looking, guess what's happening in front of you? Something's still going on and you're going to miss. This has happened to me so many times, not necessarily with wildlife, but when I do a lot of the sports stuff that I do, I shoot a few golf tournaments every year. The shot for golf is, uh, is not golf you you guys know it's boring right i mean you're just watching a guy smack a ball around and trying to put in a little hole the shot is the reaction and if you're busy chimping saying oh yeah i just well, I got it you know you just hit the ball really cool the reaction is until the ball hits and you or the shot is until that ball hits and then the golfer's reaction whether it's super awesome or just disgust or whatever that's the shot people want to see so don't be thinking you nail it and go to chimping because your chances are pretty good you're going to miss something that's even better. And it's it's happened to me more. I've, I've learned my lesson. It's not going to happen anymore, but it's happened several times where I see it. I see the reaction. The camera's not taking any pictures. The camera's down here around my waist. And I just look up and I miss the fist pump or I miss the whatever it is that told the whole story way better than any picture I got. Where I thought you were going to go with that when you first started talking and you want to be careful with chimping in the field, but when the action's over, when the animal disappears into the brush, whatever the case may be, if you think it's one of those images that you're going to want to go to right away, you hit your you know one star on the rating. You don't have to look at all of them. It just gives you a starting point when you're going through your you know reel or your timeline at the bottom of Lightroom. That star will give you, okay, this is the sequence that I'm looking for. So that's, you know, you're not looking at all the images. You're just giving yourself a, a starting point when you get home. Do your chimping at home with the star. Right, with the star. <laughs> Great yeah. tip. Yeah, I try not to chimp at all in the field unless I wait till I get back to the room. Because don't get me wrong, you get excited about, ooh, I think I got something cool. But I don't even look until I get back to the room or the car or whatever it might be. So, And I don't look until it's in two places. Ah, uh, interesting. It has mm. to be on two hard drives before, and the card that it was on before I'll look. 
Speaking wow. of, of a brand new CF Express card. <laughs> it's been used three times. <laughs> it's still on the card. I've got it on two drives. And Lightroom will not read any of the files. Reads the video just fine. None of the still images will read. Out of the R5? It, yep. It says that they are... What did it say? Corrupt. They're uh, corrupt. Corrupt. Yeah, corrupt files. That's yeah. the error that I got. Well, hopefully like you I weren't said, the, shooting. The video is great. A monkey in Ethiopia. I was <laughs> not, and, and you were right. I can't even. I still can't. I can't remember again what it was. But that you were right when you named gelata or something. Yeah, gelata. Um, no, I was. It was sheep, but yeah. It won't read a single We'll have to one. dig into that and see if they can be repaired I've somehow. been digging into it for a week. <laughs> Are we talking five images or like 100 images? Uh, or how? About 300, yeah. Oh, Not wow. a lot because I'm I was videoing though. mostly, but yeah. And did that happen between video clips? Or? <clears throat> yes, yep. Hmm. So was it, it wasn't a... just at one point it stopped. It was, you know, it was throughout the shoot. All the video is good. All the data is there. Is this a good card or, I mean, a well-known card brand or is it an off-brand or what is it? it? No, it's a well-known brand. Hmm. Yep. Speaking of CF Express, did you hear Nikon 850 has got an update? Firmware? To, okay. to take the CF Express? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it should. But the Anyways, CF side Express note, but... drive should take the XQD too, so then I'd be able to use them and they wouldn't be worthless anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right, Mark. Fire away. Uh, guy, this card talk. I looked at my SD cards that I bought in Alaska. No tax in Anchorage. Uh, great deal, 60 bucks a year and a half ago. And they're the backup cards or, or the overflow cards that are in the 850. It was 90, uh, meg, is it megabytes per second, right? Yeah. Megabytes yeah. per second. And it does end up buffering on the 850. And I just went online. So I, people who've had a card for a year and a half or two, it's worth checking out. For 40 bucks, it's now 170 megabytes per second. I know I'm a little behind the curve here. But <laughs> if I'm behind the curve about this stuff and I do it all the time, then I'm thinking some of the listeners, you know, it's worth revisiting the, what these speeds are because it's a great price point and practically doubles the right speed. Important for video. And cards right. do go bad, so it's yeah. not a bad practice just to throw them out after a couple of years. But not on your second or third shoot. You should no, <laughs> no. But I have a card just like that, Ron, that just doesn't perform, and it it just right out of the gate it didn't. So I would say just send it back if you can and get a new one. Yeah, the I don't think there's any barn burner images in there, but. The problem is, is I would like to see if for myself a, find if, you out nailed if, there's, it. if there's anything. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea it. if I nailed it because <laughs> I can't even see a single image. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our next question. Uh, Jay Taylor Outdoor on Instagram. It's not really about wildlife photography, but he'd like to hear about insurance on equipment and how we manage that. Woo. I just, I just wing it. <laughs> Frisbee? <laughs> no, for many, for many years, I had it on my homeowner's policy, and we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back and listen to the, the first Nampa short that we did, Jason and and Don and myself, we talked a little bit about the insurance that Nampa offers, and it's for photographers. It's you know the bigger the group. The way insurance works, the bigger the group, the cheaper it's going to be. So to have it on your homeowner's policy is fairly reasonable. The problem is, is if you file a claim on your camera gear, it goes against your homeowner's policy, which makes it difficult to get a new homeowner's policy should you move in the future. So you want to be really, really careful with that. Such a uh, racket. It is a racket. And then you switch to a photography policy and it costs almost as much a year as your homeowner's policy does. Again, you know, it's still the racket. You've got to pay for everybody else's mistakes too, as well as your own. 
Well, you got to pay for all those dumb commercials on TV. The Nampa, this is one advantage of being in a group of photographers because you have a larger group. You can spread the cost out to a larger group of people, which makes that insurance a little bit cheaper. So that, to me, is the best option out there right now, is the insurance that you can get through Nampa as a member. And that's worth the membership. It's worth you know, the membership. You're going to pay for the for membership. Itself. Yep. So it's going to cost you a little bit more, but it is the safer way to go. Yeah. That's a great tip. That's the quick and dirty of it. And I'm in a whole different category there. Yes, you are. But I do the same thing. I get mine through ASMP, which is another organization, but they do the same thing. Yeah, I don't think it's a good thing to have it on your homeowners. Two, the other thing is, is if you're trying to sell pictures... They could immediately, you know, that's generally for the amateur person or the serious hobby person that's not selling any pictures. If you're selling pictures and, you know, whether somebody's going to find out or not, who knows, but that's an easy way for them to say, nope, it's not covered. You're using that for professional money-making reasons. You can't have that on your homeowner's policy. So just be careful Mm -hmm. there too. Well, I had a policy. Sorry. Yeah, I shouldn't. I don't have one at the moment because I don't have as much gear as I used to have. But for 20 plus years, I paid $700 a year for all the camera gear coverage. Trip, fall, let anything happen to it. Um, It was covered. But after 20 years, I added that up, and I'd sold a whole bunch of equipment. So it's just I'm down to the bare bones for the most part. Nothing's ever, knock on wood, nothing's ever happened, right? And my gear is always with me. So it's just like an 850, a two to five, which price points, not a huge deal nowadays. If something happened to replace, I've had it for three years, no problems. And uh, my backup cameras, so I have the 850, and I have the 810, and I have a 70 to 200, I have a 24 to 70, a few other things here and there. But it just got to the point where it's like, and now it'll all come back when I, when I pick up the new mirrorless system and what that'll cost, then I'll go get insurance again. But it's always had its own... My camera gear has always had its own policy. It was an inland marine policy. It was categorized through, at the time, it was State Farm Insurance. But they left Canada, and it's that's changed. So I've always had it. It was great peace of mind. Hiking up for dull sheep, something happens, the cameras are covered. But at the point now, it just after 20 years, so I've the past year or so, I've taken a break, and I don't have coverage on the cameras at the moment. So it's Personally. self-insured. Self-insured, <laughs> and I'm willing to take the risk for what it is. But like I said, as soon as I end up adding $10,000 of new gear, then I'm going to have to reinstate a policy. If you trip gear. and fall, though, I do have an 850. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, just gonna, there we I'm go. I'm going to throw that out there every week until, <laughs> yeah, okay. until somebody needs it. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> along those lines, I was thinking we should have a for sale page on our website and just all the wild and exposed camera gear that's for sale yeah and Jason. that inland marine policy mark yes. is is attached to your homeowners but it was it was for the corporation so it was its own self-standing but it yeah i was it's its own policy at least i always okay paid it separately. So maybe yeah. separately. So it, it was a weird thing because as a wildlife photographer you know it's it's like finding insurance to do workshops. It's like when you walk into most places, they're going to scratch your head and say, you want to take people to see bears or, you know, <laughs> Not gonna what? Happen. and you want insurance <laughs> for that. So it's yeah. the same idea. Well, I want to carry this camera up and down Rocky mountains and across bogs and whatever in a canoe. And they're like, so they made up this policy and I don't know how common it was, but that's just what they called it that I had for all those years. Mm-hmm. And a conversation, even with my insurance agent back in the day, because I paid for it forever and never had a claim. I'm like, buddy, what if I have a claim? But he said, it won't affect your policy. I said, you've had this for me. I know I've bought my equipment again through you guys. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. More than once kind of thing. So it was like, all right. But it's important to have if, if it's and it's good to research it, get different quotes as with anything in life. But we, I haven't heard from Jason on. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I- no, I, I have very much the same thoughts. I actually had mine through my home policy. I don't have a policy right now. I actually just look at it. I took it off my home policy because of that very reason that Ron said. 
And um, the same reason that Mike said too about uh, being for used for business purposes or something like that, it could be an issue. Um, but it still does cover it for you know, on, on your home policy and your auto policy too for um, theft and things like that. So even if you have a home policy or an auto policy and you don't specifically list it, it's still covered through your home and your auto policy for mm-hmm. theft. Or if it got damaged in an accident or something like that and it was in the car or fire burned in the house, it would be covered. But for damage and trip and fall and all that kind of stuff, I don't have any coverage. And I'm kind of like you. I'm self I'm going on the self-insured mode right now. The deductibles are a little high, but you know, it's right. a hundred percent deductible. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, well, and keep so in now, mind too, if you're going to do workshops, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners are not out there leading workshops, but <clears throat> national parks nowadays require a liability policy. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah. you have to have that yep. kind of stuff too, and you can wrap all that stuff together if you want to. And I have that. I just don't have my cameras insured. Right. <laughs> the liability was cheaper than the camera insurance. They know you're a safe guy and you're from Canada. How many more questions do you guys want to run with? Because there's well, one We're at an hour 30 right now. Let's do just yeah, one let's, more. Let's do the wrap up question. Only one more? All right. So we're going to pick up, keep the questions coming in. Because we love doing these podcasts. We love interacting with all of you in this fashion. We love being able to give a shout out for those that send the questions in. And we didn't get to them all today that we'd picked. So we'll do another podcast down the road. So keep them coming. We do appreciate it. So Roxbury underscore actual sent in. You always ask us what our favorite wildlife experiences are. What are y'all's favorites? Y'all. So when we're in the field, if, if we could relive something, I assume this is where he's coming from. What's our favorite kind of situation to be in? I figured it'd be nice to end the podcast with a few stories. Ron, Mr. Ron Hayes, what's your favorite kind of experience that if you could recreate as a wildlife photographer, you'd go back to again this well, second? The one that I would love to go back to and actually have a camera in my hands because I was out, I, w- I was just out in the woods. And I saw a set of tracks that I've never seen before. And I got curious. And it was, you could tell they were fresh. Um, They hadn't melted out. There was no new snow. The snow was still coming down. There was no new snow in the track. So I knew I was close to whatever it was. And quite honestly, we were talking about wolverines a little bit ago. I'd never seen these tracks before. I was not familiar with what wolverine tracks look like. But they seemed about the right size. Um for what I would what I would think a wolverine track would look like. And I came up and, and kind of started to come out of this little depression. And all of a sudden, up over the top of this log, this brown head stared right at me. And I can still remember this scene because it was just it was just perfect. The light was gorgeous and it everything was still. There was nobody else there. And uh it was a fisher. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a fisher they're really rare to be seen in Wyoming. There's some areas in the state, though, if you do some research, you can find little crust clusters of sightings. But this fisher just looked up over the top of this log and checked me out for about 30 seconds and then just kind of turned and wandered on about his day. And I would love to have had a camera at at that moment. I guess if if I'm going to, I'm going to, add one more the first wolf i ever saw was in uh, the canadian rockies and i was in banff national park just i woke up at like three in the morning and it was already starting to get light out and everybody else in the cabin was asleep so i just took off and went for a little drive and i had this little hi8 sony handy cam and um, these wolves were feeding on an elk I didn't know that at the time. I just knew they were all bedded down and knew they were probably had full bellies. And that's the only reason they would still be laying there. But this wolf kind of trotted along the top of this little canal. And then he went off the backside of the canal. And when he came up, his eyes were, his eyes and ears were over the top of the canal bank. And the only other thing you could see was the steam from his breath, you know, had that morning breath. And I got it on my high eight video camera, but the footage is 
less than amateurish. <laughs> it's borderline garbage, but you know, it did capture the moment. And I, but I would love to have been where I am now, and be able to capture that as well because I can still remember that in my mind. It was just the, you know, I literally, literally, was jumping up and down, high fiving myself <laughs> because I, you know, I'd never seen a wolf before, and that was about the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. Could, but could that you, could that you enact that sure. force real quick? That no. up and down high five in yourself. <laughs> oh, on camera. I don't. At this point in life, I don't think anybody wants to see that, Jason. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> no, but those are those are the two experiences I'd love to have back or or be able to have now. You know, and neither neither one of them really had anything to do with the camera. It was more just the experience of it all. All right, somebody else's turn. Michael, let's just go with the one I talked about earlier. I mean, that was all, you know, we talk about that all the time with the slide days, right? And if you could do some of the stuff you saw back in the slide days now, I mean, just how early you could shoot, how late you could shoot, unlimited numbers of pictures. I mean, when you have a a kill out in front of you for two and a half days, and there's, I think I can't remember now, probably 11 or 12 different wolves that were there all the time. There was pups, part of them. The adults were bringing the pups out. There were grizzly bears, or yeah, grizzly bears at that point, coming in and out, different. I think we had 11 or 10 or 11 bears and 11 or 12 wolves over three days. There was always a predator within sight for three days. If I could do that again, I'd, I'd do it in a new New York minute. If you could do that again, I'd go with you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a video that I shot from that. I'll have to see if I can put it. It's so, I mean, we're talking slide days, right? So I, like Ron, I didn't have a high eight. I had the next step up, whatever what that was, maybe HD. I don't know. The old Canon XL1. But it's only 720 pixels wide, the actual video that I shot. But you do see all these different wolves. In, and we're... 60 yards away. What were you going to say, Mark, with today's technology? Uh, I think I think that's a great answer to Cameron's question because it's the perfect scenario that if you had today's technology to redo, would yeah. be f- so much fun because of the, the, the versatility and uh, what we can do now with the camera equipment. Uh, yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I sh- if there's any point in telling a story. <laughs> After that, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You guys have to. (laughs) All right. I'll let Jason go last. And (laughs) mine would be slide days as well, where there were two incredible bull moose in the backcountry in Alaska sparring. We spotted them about a mile away and would never expect them to keep at it for, for that long. But we were able... I, my friend Bob Shilleroff, who was with me on that trip, and myself were able to get to them and probably have 15 minutes or so photographing them still sparring before they stopped. And it was the same kind of situation that I'd like to repeat with the new technology now. But, I mean, the, it was perfect, overcast, even light, incredible foliage, and the setting was the Alaska range behind them. I didn't get the Alaska range. That's part of why I'm telling the story. But I, in my moose book, I put it as the only one where there's four pictures on a spread to show the interaction of these big bulls. So that, uh, four small pictures over the two pages. But just to be there and to watch them posture and spar pre-rut, why I'd like to redo it is I would like to have more. At that time, I believe it was just a 500 millimeter prime I was carrying, 500 F4, on the tripod back in those days. So I positioned myself where I wanted to be to get the first shots, but there wasn't a lot of opportunity to change it up in the 15 minutes or so that they sparred after we got to them. I would love now to have been able to do that, to have a zoom or pivot and get some of the mountain range behind them as well as just the interaction of the two of them despite the color and the saturation and the how wonderful that was 
I didn't get as much out of it as if I could do it over with new equipment. Ah, <laughs> in, in a, as as Michael says, in a new in a New York minute, yeah. I would. Yeah, wrap it up, Jason. All right. Well, I, I don't even know if I should. I think everybody here could guess what my favorite thing to experience out in the the wild is. Prairie dogs. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they sell so good. Um, no, it, it'd be the elk rut. I mean, for me, I've been very, very fortunate through this photography and through hunting to have experienced some incredible rut frenzies over the years, um, more so with my camera. Um, but just that's just, it's hard to compete. It's hard to compete with anything I can think of. I've just uh, every time I get the opportunity to experience one. Most of the times now, I pretty much stop shooting and just and just kind of try to soak it in. Um, so that's what I would just not that, that, that it's not really a redo, but it's what I would love to go do again and again and again, if that makes sense. The one the one I will say that it might be a redo, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but the more I thought about it, I, I had the opportunity to go to Denali a couple years ago, and I went there with a lot of really high expectations, and I really regret going there with those high expectations now, not because I didn't come home. I didn't come home with very many images. That's a fact. And, and, and the, my expectations were that I would, um, I think I've talked about it before. I bought extra battery cards, extra memory card or battery card, extra batteries, extra memory cards expecting. I was just going to fill them up and it was just going to be amazing. The experience was amazing, regardless of what I got. And I really think I cheated myself out of the opportunity to have that real experience because I went with the expect the high expectations. So I definitely want to go do it again. I didn't really at the time think I ever would want to because it was such a bummer in the way of what I my high expectations. But I'm at a point now where I absolutely would like to go do it again. But this time, I think I would go into it with a whole different perspective. And... I would be going much more for just the experience and the um, the getaway and the environment, and I would just go with the idea to just take what comes and and just enjoy every every minute of it. So that's that would be my two, I think. But. Great spin. Let's do it. Okay, I'm game. When? <laughs> well, we're all supposed to be free by September. Hoping maybe in Canada, you guys only have to come up with what 30 million vaccines, yeah, 40 million yeah. vaccines. I don't even know what the population is up there, but I'm probably around 35 or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, so I think I'm like 295 million on the list. Yeah, <laughs> I'm one step below you, probably. <laughs> it's uh, it'll be big business. I've, I, I, I have no idea, but I hope that make a lot of it quickly yeah well i'm sure so it'll be on the news story around here they're saying if it, anybody that wants one should be able to get it by june there you go well so. that's a lot of time for our, our planning to do that together again with jason right so three years brothers it's been fun every step of the way that i've been involved in Mike, Ron, Jason, our awesome audience, thank you for coming along on this adventure with us, hearing our stories, meeting all these amazing guests that we've been able to spend time with over the past three seasons. And I assume I'm speaking for all the guys is that we're super excited, starting with next week's podcast, to start season four with you. So come along. There's lots more to come. More adventures, more stories. Send in your listener questions. Send us the comments. You can find more of our work on wildandexposed.com. Check out each week's podcast show notes on there to read more about behind the scenes, the photos that were discussed by us or by our guests, and also the links to everybody's sites and information, especially when it comes to our guests. It's a great way to connect. You can also send us your email on wildandexposed.com. Sign up, and that way you'll be notified when future podcasts are coming out or when there's a sale coming down the pipeline at the Wild and Exposed store that Michael Morrow so expertly set up this fall. 
that helps support our podcast and our efforts in bringing you this weekly show. The stuff is good. We tested it out. The toque, the beanie, it's warm. It works well. For those of you that have ordered, thank you. You can also find our work on Instagram, Facebook, the YouTube video portions of our podcast come up each Friday, the audio on Tuesday. Give us a thumbs up, positive review, as that helps us to do what we love to do and to bring you this podcast on a weekly basis. Guys, see you next week for season four. (laughs) Thank you, everybody. Until next time, you've been listening to Wild and Exposed Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. We got our windows down, driving down the 405, sing along to the radio. Mm-mm. We're gonna make it someday, nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in town.